So hello everyone, um, and a very warm welcome to Sri Lankan English writing from independence to the Jam Tree, a conversation with uh, Vihanga Pereira. My name is Nelani Kikosta, and I'm a lecturer attached to the Department of Languages at the Southeast University of Sri Lanka. So let me start the session by introducing our resource person for the day. Vihanga Pereira is a creative writer, researcher, and one-time academic who has an interest in Sri Lankan English literature. He is an occasional writer on topics related to Sri Lankan writing, arts and culture, and mentor in creative writing. He received his school education at Kingswood College Candy, read for an honors degree in English, and a master in philosophy degree at the University of Pera Denia, and is at present reading for a PhD in creative writing at the Australian National University in Canberra. He was a lecturer in literature at the University of Sri Jayavadanapura uh, for eight to nine years, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, at the University of, and at the University of Pera Denia on a visiting basis. His research interests include literatures of conflict, memory studies, post-colonial literature, Sri Lankan English literature, and Asian literature. Vihanga has published poetry, short story, fiction, collection of critical essays, and biography, and has won several national awards, including the prize in 2000, including uh, the Gratian Prize in 2014, and the State Literary Award in 2015 for his book of poems, Love and Protest. He has also been shortlisted for the Gratian Prize in 2006 for his debut publication, um, Their Autopsy, and in 2008 for Stable Horses, and in 2019 for his manuscript and entitled Sentimental Pieces, The Private Funeral, and the Classical Ball. His recent work includes the biographical work, Bodies in Art, uh, which draws an arts and literature scene in Sri Lanka during Vihanga's early, early years as a writer, and Jean's a memorial anthology for Jean Arsenaigam, of which Vihanga was the publisher and editor. He also maintains several blogs, such as uh, In Love with a Veil and A Lankan Association and Fish on the Sand, and a Facebook group called the Primrose Road Poetry, which is an open and shared space for good and engaging poetry where people can contribute to or read. Recently, he also worked on a project entitled Screaming School Memory, with several writers and artists to feature poetic work, sentiments, and artwork based on memories of school. He is a versatile person who is constantly and actively engaged in various projects within and beyond the field of Sri Lankan English literature. So Vihanga, over to you. So, um, so initially when this entire thing came up, I was under the misconception that this would be a Southeastern university affair, uh, but um, there's a feeling that there are a few others involved as well, but nonetheless, what I, what I thought was I will just share a few thoughts, keeping Southeastern in mind, the kind of work people have done there, the kind of work people are doing um, in this uh, semester and maybe the next semester to come. Uh, so look, this is how I have uh, organized this little interaction. Um, Zoom not being my you know, preferred, preferred channel of communication, I might actually go on for about 20 minutes uh, or to up to half an hour probably. And I'll be sharing uh, some thoughts, definitely not a comprehensive account, uh, definitely not, not the whole deal to do with uh, Sri Lankan writing from uh, independence to 1993, uh, 45 years, right? Uh, there is a lot and definitely I'll be uh, probably leaving out, I'll be missing out on some but I'm trying to cover a substantial ground based on which we can go into a conversation after that, maybe for about 15, 20 minutes. So this is uh, me giving a disclaimer statement right up front that uh, this interaction will only kind of benefit or hit the optimum mark with a two-way interaction. So people 
uh, we'll have to, I guess, uh, ask a few questions, make a few comments, uh, seek clarifications, right? Um, and also there is a kind of a widespread feeling and I th think some of the former Javardhanapura, pe former Javardhanapura people here might agree that uh, sometimes I'm not very clear when I express myself. I know that I have that handicap. I can be a bit convoluted. I can be a bit vague, right? So there will be a lot of space for clarification. Um, so maybe you can, you know, um, make a hit with a few uh, two, two way two way traffic, right? So just for starters, just to kind of refresh our minds, I'll uh, quickly belt through the kind of work on Sri Lankan writing Southeastern is doing. Um, this is a list I got earlier from uh, Nelani. Uh, so Southeastern does a fairly comprehensive, <laughs> I would say, syllabus on Sri Lankan writers in the English writing in English language. Uh, poets like Anne Ranasinghe, um, Patrick Fernando, Lakdas Vikramasinghe, Richard de Soiza, Jean Arasanayagam. Uh, altogether about 20 poems there across those four writers. So when you say Patrick Fernando to Jean Arasanayagam, we are basically looking at um, 40 years of poetry from the 50s to the 90s, the kind of time frame we are going to work within today. Then there are some short stories. Um, Lalita Vitanachi is the tip of the iceberg uh, uh, from her short story collection from 1993. Uh, uh, one of my personal favorite short stories, I should say, the tip of the iceberg. Vijita Fernando, The Homecoming. Neil Fernando Pule, Afterglow. Uh, Ayature Santan, The Cuckoo's House. Chitra Fernando, Action and Reaction. Couple of novels, uh, Giraya 1971, Pundekanti Vijayanayaka, uh, Visakesa Chandrasekaram, Tigers Don't Confess, 2011. So that is the kind of uh, syllabus. Uh, this is for people not, uh, you know, pretty much on the same page. So this is to kind of bring people together. Um, so the, the, the first thing I would like to clarify is why this interaction is kind of limited to uh, writing 1948 to 1993. Uh, why stop at 1993? Because many people might even argue that um, some of the more interesting Sri Lankan writing actually starts with 1993 with uh, the publication of uh, Jam Fruit Tree, Karl Muller's um, iconic novel, one of three, the Burger Trilogy so-called, right? Um, I thought of drawing the line at 1993 uh, for one obvious reason. The way I look at Sri Lankan writing across the last century, uh, for my purposes, I, I break it down into three compartments. One is the writing that came before independence, right? the first part of the 20th century. Then the writing uh, that emerged through the immediate post-independence nationalist phase, uh, 1950s, 1960s, up to the late 1980s, perhaps terminating with the early 90s, where the third phase starts, where I am concerned. The third phase where Sri Lankan writing actually becomes an international product, right? In the sense we consume it today, in the sense we read it today. Jam fruit tree or thereabouts is where we, st we, we started seeing writers going international by default, 19, early 1990s. And in the next 30 years from, let's say, 1992, where we are today, 2020, um, the international publishing market, uh, people who publish internationally, as well as people who write from outside, Sri Lankans, uh, people with Sri Lankan heritage who write from outside, collectively have actually taken over Sri Lankan literature uh, in English the next 30 years. So if I may put it this way, I would even say Sri Lankan English writing doesn't belong to Sri Lanka right now <laughs> in 2020, right? This is dominated by uh, either writers writing from outside, 
whether they are temporarily outside Sri Lanka or they are expatriates, um, citizens of other countries, or whether this literature is being published elsewhere. Um, resident Sri Lankan writers, people who write from Sri Lanka, the present day generation of the kind of people we'll talk about in the next 20 minutes, they're almost uh, relegated to some obscure nook from which they produce their, uh, you know, novels to be stacked in dusty corners of leading bookshops uh, in some of the cities even you and I frequent, right? So for me, this is a face of Sri Lankan writing that has to be discussed uh, separately. And uh, that's why I draw the line in 1993. So maybe if, uh, I don't know, we feel like it, we can actually have a second meeting later on to discuss what's going on because a lot is happening in Sri Lankan writing. I should say now, right now where we are in 2020, there, there's a big paradigm shift happening in terms of publication, in terms of the themes that interest uh, contemporary writers. I, I don't know what is happening. I would take more time to conclude what's happening, but we see, we see funny things like things that were unprecedented, things we haven't seen before in Sri Lankan writing taking place. For one thing, in the last five to eight years, um, e-publication has become widespread. It has become prevalent. It has become, uh, I would say, a convenient option for anyone who wants to express him or herself. So we have a branch of writers who uh, kind of connect with the world more easily, uh, cost effectively through uh, e, e media. Then we have uh, social media making uh, better connections with communities and people, uh, circulating literature, giving uh, visibility to literature, uh, unlike uh, what it has been in, you know, the kind of conventional uh, marketing chains along the line. And then interestingly, this actually, you might, uh, you, you, you can double check if you go to bookshops today, uh, especially in the last five to eight years, we have an increasing number of publications in genres that were traditionally not a part of Sri Lankan writing, like fantasy fiction, for example. I'm not a big fan of fantasy fiction, but the number of fan fiction novels you find in Sri Lankan bookshelves by Sri Lankan writers uh, to me, it's frankly alarming <laughs> because <laughs> that's not the kind of literature I uh, buy, but these are like changes that is happening. Um, so I would definitely say there's a lot of scope for people to actually do research or to understand these changing trends in Sri Lanka, but all this we should uh, leave aside for, a, for another day, for another interaction. Um, so now today's um, this this limited interaction, I would say this 20, 30 minute interaction, I would like to cut through 45 years of Sri Lankan writing from independence to 93. This channeling I would do mainly focusing on three key areas or three key moments. So these are the kind of three moments I'm going to anchor the discussion on. But there will be a lot of gaps, as I said earlier, which we can come back to. We can, you know, try to fill it together maybe later on in a conversation. Uh, so the first area I would like to talk about, I'll just, I'll just highlight these three movements up front. I would be maybe spending a few minutes on um, the novel between the 1960s and I would say 1990, the late 80s, early 90s. Um, and when I kind of refer to this novel <laughs> in a very loose sense, I might probably talk a bit about James Gunawardhana, Punyakanti uh, Vijayanayaka, whose giraya apparently is being read at uh, Southeastern, and Raja Proctor. So these are like the three big fish where I'm concerned in framing the novel uh, from the 1950s to uh, the late 80s, 60s to the late 80s. And then I would spend some time maybe just glossing over 
what I call uh, poetry that challenged the status quo. That is what I call it for, you know, for my purposes, for convenience, for this kind of conversation. Uh, so this is where I look at some of the writers. This is where I generally look at some of the writers who try to, you know, respond to the existing status quo. The existing status quo could be uh, the political or the socio-cultural. It could be the idiomatic status quo, right, uh, of literature uh, through their creative work. Uh, so we can kind of bring in several writers into this equation. But uh, for today, I would like limit, uh, you know, our discussion to two people. This is also keeping Southeastern in mind, uh, Lakdas Vikramasinghe and uh, Richard Isoiza probably, right? And then thirdly, a little bit about uh, writing on conflict, which I think uh, is fairly widespread if you take the 1980s, especially the literature that, be, that, that emerged in the 80s. Um, it, it is more prevalent in the 90s, I agree, but then we closed shop in 1993. But, so therefore, the literature of the 80s, looking at uh, this uh, emerging uh, conflicts in the Sri Lankan socio-political fabric from the 70s onwards, uh, the 1971 youth uprise, for example, then uh, the anti-Tamil riots in 1983. So I would probably kind of uh, take this as the uh, loose roadmap to channel our discussion today. Now, if you look at 1950s to the late, late 1980s in a very broad social sense, uh, social and political sense, um, I think it, 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 it'll be helpful if you ask the question, what are some of the, you know, the big epoch defining changes that took place that would have had an influence on the, you know, the creative expression writers undertook. Because um, writing, the kind of literary production we see in poetry, novel, so on and so forth is always essentially a cultural response, isn't it? It's like a cultural response to social, political uh, changes, tensions, frictions that happen around you. So if you actually backtrack and try to figure out some of these big changes that happened. Well, we can talk about this for a week, uh, just pausing for, you know, meals and beverage. But if I may just uh, kind of uh, put on the table four uh, broadly locatable um, factors that shape Sri Lankan society, we have things like um, the spread of the middle class, uh, which is unmistakable, I would say, uh, if you compare what it meant to be Sri Lanka's middle class in the 1950s, what it meant in the 1980s, right? And if you compare that with what the middle class means today, that change is like quite palpable. It's, it's a big change, it's a big shift. So the kind of literature we are gonna talk about, um, it happens parallel to the growth of Sri Lankan society, uh, the expansion of that middle class and Usually in any society, it's the middle class that carries the the energy, you know, that steers the the, the uh, steers the society in certain directions. I think the best example, if you want to kind of go back on this, can be found in um, I would say the shaping of the modern European nation state, right, in the 18th, uh, sorry, in the 19th century, and uh, tracing back from different. Uh, historical moments to see how the middle class, the values, the value system uh, that comes with it becomes the catalyst to carry society forward. Same thing in the case of Sri Lanka. So the spread of the middle class and the urban population, um, this is one of those, uh, you know, defining factors. Then I would say even the changing status of the English language what it meant to, you know, uh, write in English, what it meant to express yourself in English, what it meant to use English, especially if you didn't belong to, especially if you belong to, you know, that middle class I'm talking about, the lower middle class, from the 50s upwards to the 90s. Um, parallel to that, you can take the spread of English. 
um for example i don't know maybe just a few years ago um you wouldn't have an english degree at southeastern university if you see what i mean right uh i studied i i went to school at a time where i i studied in kandy as nilani pointed out i studied in a time where uh for a levels for languages you know uh people from kurunagal and kegal used to come to kandy to enroll in schools to study english and french but it's no longer the case i'm talking about probably you know 20 years ago right um then also i would say if you look at literature per se uh the english department the english academy uh moving away from uh gatekeeping or setting rules for english literature or steering the direction of what is english literature so in the last 30 years also most decisively this is this is felt that you know people uh who know about literature people who kind of engage in literary discussions are not exactly in the forefront of directing uh <laughs> sri lankan writing so i'm uh, not saying this is a good thing i'm just observing the fact right and also you see the last 45 years from the 80s to the 90s we have had a shift in the education medium from um, to singala in 1958 i would say from 58 to 61 in that time period there was a shift of education into singala and tamil compulsory and later this was revised as late as 2002 where english medium was reintroduced so so my point here is for people to kind of you know take a step back and try to be sensitive or aware of some of the historical factors that shape uh the production the reception the circulation of english writing uh, 50s to 90s and then beyond and you know as a mental exercise try to freeze it at different historical points and try to imagine what it means to uh produce compose in english to read in english what does it mean to you know be a part of that kind of literary engagement so i want you to kind of create that kind of um, imagination that kind of consciousness when you think about uh, sri lankan writing from decade to decade all right so let me get down to those uh, three movements which i highlighted earlier through which i want to study this discussion um the S sri lankan english novel i think this is uh, widely documented this is uh, there's a lot of secondary literature if people are interested to you know look into these uh, uh, some of these points i'm sharing but if you look at the 1950s uh there is a feeling that uh post independence and this is not only i think uh, unique to sri lanka this can be seen in some of the other uh countries which were part of the former uh european colonial network uh, there's this resurgence of uh post independence nationalist feeling which there is a fee there, there is a widespread belief uh, hampered the growth of english writing in sri lanka so not many people we are told right this is what some of the experts say not many people felt inclined to actually go and invest yourself um, in english production uh, production of literature in english 1950s and 1960s i i don't have a very uh, clear idea about this i i'm not decisive on this matter but i'm just kind of sharing something that has already been observed by some of the experts in the field right but then there are kind of three writers who stand out as they produce steadily in the 60s 70s and 80s um one is uh, punyakanthi vijayanayaka familiar to you people giraya probably uh probably i don't know her most widely read novel probably i don't know uh, published in 1971 but vijayanayaka was writing as early as 1963 right so 1963 then there's this other very famous novel for some reason i had to study this for my a levels long ago 
uh, called the waiting earth um that, that that is the book my generation used to learn you know sex education in the hero class right uh, the waiting earth um so vijayanayaka is one of those writers um, who has had a steady career for about 40 45 years writing across a range of spaces from you know rural sri lanka to urban themes uh, cross national themes writing across class um someone who has been uh, praised for making an effort actually you know whether she succeeds or not that is up for grabs but for making an effort to actually um, harmonize herself with the pulse uh, of the people to represent communities and societies which she living in a metropolitan you know um, setting was not comfortable with was not her first hand uh, was not a part of her first hand reality right so this vijayanayaka and then there is raja proctor uh, proctor who published uh between uh her, the the last works coming in the early 1980s uh in that uh, 30 in that uh, 20 year period uh, three uh three important novels uh, of which i would say my favorite is waiting for surabiel but before that he has uh, an illicit immigrant and a fisherman's daughter um proctor's significance for me uh is the kind of sensitivity he has to uh, the lives and um the economies of people of working class underprivileged marginalized backgrounds so waiting for surabiel for example it's uh, a, a, a brilliant novel it, it is in many ways an echo of a novel like um, when memory dies in in certain ways right but uh, he is someone who is trying to capture and i i would say he succeeds in capturing the kind of uh, complexity of uh, the colonial encounter and its residue in the after colonial uh, the post colonial aftermath um an illicit immigrant fisherman fish, fish, fisherman's daughter and waiting for surabiel fisherman's daughter actually was also made into a movie later uh, if people are interested uh, this is uh, i think freely available on uh, uh, youtube uh, it's uh, it's a it's a single movie it's it's called uh, uh, divari geethe starring sangeeta veeratna and you know that kind of thing so if people are interested uh, um raja proctor so he had a very uh, in my opinion he had a uh, close uh, he had a he had a way of connecting with the people uh, at the at the working class uh, level people who were marginalized underprivileged whose voices were not heard i would say um with uh, whose voices were not empathetic who were not presented with empathy in uh, the english writerly space there's a, a brilliant assessment on raja proctor uh, by professor dcr gunatilaka uh gunatilaka actually ranks him very high uh, raja proctor um uh, gunatilaka kind of looks at proctor <laughs> there are certain things about uh, gunatilaka's uh, <laughs> comments that doesn't really sit with me uh, he, he says something like this though you know <laughs> proctor is you know not ethnically uh, singhalese in that sense he has a way of connecting with the singhalese working class uh, and so forth which sounds a bit problematic when he puts it that way right but i would say uh, proctor's uh, resonance with that marginalized reality uh, it's not a matter of ethnicity or it's not a matter of uh you know really religious affinity it's something that cuts across and it is um, quite uh so the third writer i want to evoke in this uh, equation is uh, james gunawardena now james gunawardena in many ways uh, is uh, similar to vijayanayaka who had a uh, career cutting across uh, four decades who published quite consistently 
uh, starting 1968 with uh, A Quiet Place, and then uh, The Call of the Kerala in 1972. Um, again, I would say, uh, in many ways, uh, James Gunavardhana also went in search of uh, socioeconomic terrain, socioeconomic nooks that were marginal in a way. Uh, I'll come to this in two minutes, uh, kind of finishing James Gunavardhana's uh, profile, because I want to connect the kind of early writing Gunavardhana was interested in with what persisted towards the tail end of his career. In 76, Gunavardhana published a collection of short stories, probably uh, this is uh, one of the short stories that has stayed with English literature students even up to this day. Uh, the collection was called The Awakening of Dr. Kirti and Other Stories. The title story be being The Awakening of Dr. Kirti. Uh, it's almost like a 40, 45 page short story. Um, then An Asian Gambit, followed by One Mad Bid for Freedom in 1990. Now, the, the common thread I want to kind of um, locate here is uh, Gunavardhana again being sensitive in a way to some of the social changes happening in the post-independence fabric, uh, specifically changes happening in the margins in terms of class, in terms of uh, how politics uh, affects people without clout, people you know in marginal places. Um, now I think if you take something like Dr. Kirti, it is a good, uh, it is a fairly noted uh, commentary on nepotism and things like uh, trade union cronism setting in uh, in the post-independence uh, uh, moment. And uh, one of the sensitive observations Gunavardhana draws there is how uh, the adverse outcomes of these actually affect people who are uh, downtrodden in the in the margins. So in a way, I would say Raja Proctor, James Gunavardhana, they kind of have a parallel trajectory. But something I want to introduce to this discussion, like, because all, this, all these things which I uh, parroted, these are like uh, established, these are fairly known things. But something I want to introduce anew to this discussion is how I want to locate James Gunavardhana, especially the young James Gunavardhana. Uh, 1968, 1972, uh, Quiet Place, Call of the Kerala, that James Gunavardhana, with uh, a trajectory that was happening at the time in Singhala writing, right? Uh, because um, early Gunavardhana, there is a feeling that he was someone uh, who was uh, hung up with romantic, you know, uh, landscapes, uh, idyllic kind of descriptions, because very often we see in both those novels, A Quiet Place and Call of the Kerala, if people are familiar. Um, uh, and then, uh, um, I hope I'm clear. I just got a message on my end that my connection is unstable. I'm all right, right? Can you just give me that yeah, cons confirmation? Uh, yeah, okay. For a minute, uh, I, I think we lost you for a few seconds, but now you're okay again. Okay. If you lose me again, just let me know because I can yeah. easily like switch off the camera. Okay. Yeah. So, sure. yeah. Uh, yeah, okay. So uh, I was with James Gunavardhana. I'll rewind a bit <laughs> in case I was missed for a minute. I'll just rewind a bit, okay? So I was talking about James Gunavardhana and how uh, some of his early novels were seen to be steeped in uh, romantic and idyllic uh, kind of landscapes, uh, uh, cutting, you know, cutting ideal pictures of village life. Um, uh, I think uh, uh, one of the strong criticisms in this department comes from Yasmin Gunoratna uh, writing uh, around that time. Uh, but something I would like to note here is that, you know, now look, I have to like, I have to confess that I myself have bought into this kind of criticism. I myself has said this, 
uh, when I was maybe you know in my early twenties when I was in uh, when I was a student. But since then, I've also tried to understand you know the bigger picture of what was happening around James Gunawardena. So these are people who are working in a particular working with a certain kind of a certain um, uh, post independence nationalist uh, sentiment around them which i think by degrees uh, prompted writers like gunavardhana to actually revise uh, where they are revise uh, the kind of uh, econo- the, the, the kind of economic and social uh, tensions frictions that uh, pre exist around them now around this time in the 1960s we have another writer who in in whose novels we see this same motif of people turning away from uh metropolitan excess and the kind of uh, fast paced um you know the rat race which i would say all of us are part of at different de- degrees uh, and this is a writer called k jayatilak very i think a respected uh, famous writer in singhala literature where we have a series of novels k jayadilak writing uh, across the 1960s there is a familiar motive of people actually abandoning uh, the urban lifestyle for a lifestyle of minimalism right now that's how i i call james gunawardhan as protagonists now i don't call them people who kind of fulfill a romantic agenda on the writer's path so these are people who kind of adopt minimalism um it's a kind of a it's that kind of escape right so one invitation i would like to share with people is actually to look at some of these writers uh who may have been read insufficiently because of our ignorance uh, because you see our our reading of literature it is almost always framed in the backdrop of certain grand narratives right uh, when i say we read literature against grand narratives what i mean is when we look for themes or whatever we call them in the books we read we are always looking at them in relative to some of the bigger things that happen around us so sri lankan writing what are some of these grand narratives conflict is one definitely right gender is one class class relations is another right but when we do this we actually deselect another range of narratives around which our reading of books can be framed so maybe this tussle this friction against capitalism or whatever because sri lanka had this very dominant socialist you know very dominant community oriented sentiment in the 50s and 60s we run the risk of missing out on this so my invitation on part is to try to you know step back from some of the dominant narratives that dictate to our reading of literature where we are today and try to see these writers whom we have shelved as not very significant anymore take them out again and see how they might connect with where we are today as a community as a society right actually i want to finish my talk with this uh, <laughs> this is how it happens i want to say this at the end but it has somehow found its way to the middle but if you look at things like you know the big debates happening today climate crisis right ecological crisis i would say james gunawardhan is right up there right james gunawardhan especially his last novel uh, one mad bit for freedom there's this enigmatic probably the most enigmatic character james gunawardhan ever created uh, coral right uh, in many ways many people feel this is like a you know a semi semi biographical take that it is uh, the the protagonist is actually none other than gunawardhan himself the kind of um, case he presents for uh, the climate in that novel this is a missed area so these are like areas begging for reinvestigation uh, from us as we stand so let me not kind of uh, get stuck with gunavardhana beyond that so to summarize that section i was looking at three novelists who actually framed uh, who actually um spearheaded the flagship of sri lankan 
fiction writing between the 60s and the late 80s vijayanayaka proctor gunawardana right um, i would say gunawardana has a lot to offer sri lankan scholarship where it is today neglected right i would say uh, vijayanayaka is very much a favorite still happening still found in silabai right uh, raja proctor is my favorite of the three right waiting for surabhiel the kind of uh, resonance his assessment has with the the marginal right very memorable for someone like me so with that i would like to move on to the second part which is uh, poetry that uh, challenged the the status quo in terms of political social cultural and idiomatic so here i would like to um, talk about uh, very shortly about lakdas vikram singh and richard de soiza because uh, both of these people are in the kind of reading uh, southeast and das um so i would say um well both are dead to begin with both writers uh, quite uh, untimely deaths uh, vikram singh by uh, water the uh, soiza by fire i believe right um so also incorporating some of the reading done uh, in classroom so we have uh, poems like uh, don't talk to me about matis uh, discarded tins 1970 Uh, the death of ashanti 1974 very strong political expressions and when i say political i don't only mean like politics at the ground level but it's also to do with class politics something like the the, the death of ashanti right sexual politics so on and so forth right and then uh, we have uh, poems like uh, red the coconuts um life of the folk poet isinyo and the cobra where vikram singh tries to experiment with language a little bit right uh, now there's this uh, very famous lakdas vikram singh a quotation everyone uses in you know classrooms and essays and you know it's taken from his first collection in 1965 uh, luster poem luster poems right Uh, this note where he says that um, where 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 he denounces uh, <laughs> writing in the english language where he says that he has come to realize is writing in the language of the most despicable people on earth and you know uh, for the future of his writing uh, he wants to make his writing entirely immoralist and destructive right now we can go to town <laughs> interpreting what he meant by this right maybe he didn't mean anything he was just 24 years old at the time 1965 vikram singh i mean he didn't mean anything like you know we are when we are 24 you just put it there and here we are 40 years later trying to figure out what he meant by it but i i won't say it's entirely an original thought either because if you kind of cross the sea towards africa we have people like nugugi bathiongo who has said similar things right nugugi is uh, decolonizing the mind published in 1958 he's talking about how to kind of uh, decolonize you know how to how to um, how to save from the colonial project one's culture i mean you say one's culture one's language okay so uh in the same wavelength we have other kinds of expression where vikram singh is concerned now vikram singh actually published five collections between 1965 and 1976 five collections in both languages he was a bilingual writer and also he collected um, he 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 collected a series of poems for justin daraniagal in 1967 so so i'm just trying to give you a feel of this guy Uh, who was operating at so many different levels in that small time span and um, challenging kind of poetry politically in terms of uh, different layers of politics in terms of carrying out an ex- so I-, i wouldn't go as far as saying like some scholars have done that lakdas vikram singh wrote in you know sri lankan english i i won't say that right um that is because of my own take on what is sri lankan english right i have my own reservations there 
but i would say he was experimenting with an idiom that had a you know a greater local resonance that's what i would call it and in poems like uh, isinyo in poems like the cobra in poems like uh, the headman son published in 1965 you see traces of this right and then the other right i would like to place uh, i often place on the side of uh, vikramasinghe is the guy a decade the next decade uh, richard de soiza uh, who was composing between the late 70s and uh, the late 1980s he was killed uh, in february 1990 by the state right but this is another writer who with the same tenacity right uh, if at all with a little bit more drama a little <laughs> a little bit more literary flavor uh, challenges the status quo uh, mainly the political status quo right so we have in that department uh, poems like gajagavannam uh, if you have come across this right uh, animal crackers i think animal crackers i saw in this syllabus right um colombo in 1981 when i say uh, disoisa has a bit more literary flair he, he has a bit more flair he's, he's a bit more dramatic now one instance is you see colombo 1981 it's uh, modeled after wordsworth's famous poem uh, london 1802 so in that when he he makes it a point to say that you know i write this with apologies to uh will wordsworth right and then uh, animal crackers it's very dramatic and somewhere in the middle you have that dramatic uh, uh the, the the kind of dr- the, the the theatrical element quite uh, clearly pronounced so and of course broken promise if people have come across this poem broken promise which i like for so many different reasons uh broken promise uh, it is uh, we are told it should be sung to the tune of danno budunge uh, which itself derives from uh, ws seniors uh, him for silon so you see with someone like richard isoisa you can actually do a lot of things like map that lineage itself is a, a way of talking back to the political status quo from walter stanley senior to danno budunge in the post independence era and what he writes in the early 80s as broken promise it's a critique of uh, the government at the time right uh, quite timely i would say but um, a kind of a very frontal attack on uh, jr jawadhan's government at the time uh, for not uh, for failing to uphold its election promises so that kind of challenge then of course in the 80s we have another very important uh, category of writers and this is the last 5 uh, minutes of what i'm going to say i'm going to finish it with uh, a kind of a cursory glance at some of these writers who actually capitalize on the kind of emerging conflict in sri lanka uh, in the 70s and the 80s so political conflict uh, emerging from situations like the youth uprise in april 71 uh, july violence um which actually spills over into a decade of violence uh, the the 1980s it is a very uh, chaotic turbulent decade of violence so here i am sensitive to the work of writers like sarath chandra for example a curfew and the full moon published in 78 um writers like m chandra som i don't know whether he's Uh, quite current in these reading lists today but chandrasom has this very uh, i thought it was a very charismatic novel when i first read it i was probably too young when i first read it but um out out brief candle uh, published in 81 1981 um and also poets like jasmin gunaratna and rana singha uh, sorry um jasmin gunaratna ashley halpe uh and ranasinghe to a certain degree and and ranasinghe also becomes important when we talk about 1983 so 71 there are one or two poems 
uh, not not too impressive rana singh is still emerging i would say she's trying to find her feet as a writer in sri lanka but you know by 1983 we see uh, rana singh a more bold and frontal in making those connections between what happened in july in sri lanka with her own you know heritage um in uh, nazi germany late 1930s and there are other writers like jean arsenagam if you check jean arsenagam's collection apocalypse uh, 83 published in 1984 uh, i would say i mean to 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 this day i would say that's one of the best collections collected efforts by a sri lankan writer recently i think apocalypse was republished about 4 or 5 years ago uh, there's a new newer 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 edition of it um and writers like basil fernando who in many ways brings together his uh, literary uh, preoccupations with his activism basil fernando a leading human rights activist uh, to this day right um uh, he's uh, based in hong kong right now uh, still very active uh, still writing about even current issues in sri lanka with a, a human rights concern like forced burials and what not right um so these are like three broad uh, pillars in which i wanted to discuss uh, to, to kind of place the discussion i have uh, two more pages of notes to go with but i think um, they are not lost i will hold on to them uh, because uh, we should have enough time for a bit of uh, chat as well a bit of a uh, bit of conversation uh, so um, i'm i'm sure i confused people uh, more than enough we can take it up from here and try to kind of uh do away with the knots one by one if people have uh you know uh, uh people have uh, questions and queries okay so we can open the platform for the q and a session now so if our um participants have any questions uh, you may like you may unmute yourselves and open or like or you can even uh, send it in the chat if and also you the, the q and a can be about anything it doesn't have to be yeah, only about exactly. what we discuss it can be about any 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 anything to do with sri lankan writing right and you can um, kind of uh, you don't have to feel like hesitant uh, that you know the questions are not uh, entirely relevant there's nothing called relevance we can we can have a general conversation so while waiting for questions i'll just add a few more things i wanted to say in a very sh in a very short way right um without taking too much time so, so a couple of general points i want to make about this 1960 90 phase is that writers uh, were trying to generate a local consciousness through their writing uh that they were very introvert like they were sensitive they were turned towards local issues it's almost as if writing within a closed circuit a closed system and uh, that they had a commitment a consciousness of society what is happening there um and that caste and class issues were fairly at the forefront of some of these discussions a very now this is something you this is glaring at you the moment you take uh, more contemporary writing even some of the better writers contemporary times our times some of the better writers whose names i would not uh, you know go into their understanding their depiction their mediation with sensitive issues of class slash caste rings very hollow even in the best of cases when you compare with uh, some of the writers of the 60s and 70s so why is this now these are the things we have to find out as readers as literary scholars um i have actually <laughs> written down examples here i don't want to go there uh, writers like chitra fernando i'll just give one example uh, chitra fernando is someone who actually balances some of these realities without uh, letting them deteriorate into uh, exotic embellishments uh, th there are people who kind of turn too far backwards when you try to discuss local things now uh, chitra fernando has one uh, novel posthumously published called cousins published in 
97, I think. Um, and some of her more famous short stories published in the early 80s, a collection Three Women published in 83. Some of these um, representations, she has this knack to draw a very fine line to be tuned with the ground, the, 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 the local reality, but also not, you know, crossing the boundary to make it an embellishment. Now, I would say mm, it's not exactly the same with some of more contemporary writers. So uh, I think there's a question. Um, they are sending it to me. Um, I really? <laughs> yes. Okay. So Nalira, you can ask it on the session. Okay, miss. Hello, sir. Yes, yes, please. Please. Uh, so thank you so much for the uh, great session, sir. Um, oh. <laughs> sir, I want to ask about the story, the tip of the iceberg, since you said that you have, it's your favorite story. So could you tell me the theme of that story and the background, sir? Because we did learn that story. So I was curious about that. Yeah, I, I say that uh, to any story. I mean, when I talk, I say it's my favorite. So don't take me at my word. So this is, I think that it's, it's a very short, short story, if I remember, uh, probably four pages or something. It, it happens on the eve of the 1971 uh, Youth Uprise. So this is, there's this teacher, I think. Uh, so, the, so the writer, I think, Chit, uh, Lalita Vitanachi, that's the writer. Uh, that's actually her writing style. She brings a lot of biography into her short stories. So this one comes from her first collection, but even her later collections like Wednesday's Wife uh, and other stories, there's a lot of biography in them. So probably this is an experience she had teaching at a leading school, not very far from Jawaharlal University, going by the, you know, the clues that she gives us. Um, so it's to do with, I would say that um, class, uh, class, uh, what's the best word for it? The, the, the class friction, interclass friction felt at the time between haves and ha ha have nots, um, where the story of the Titanic sinking uh, appeals to this group of students. And then the class ends. And when class reconvenes many, many weeks later, school disrupted because of the uh, youth uprising, half the class is missing. And you know, the the charismatic last line of the short story. I, I failed as a teacher. I missed to see, I, I only saw the tip of the iceberg. So her not being aware of, uh, I think it's a very good lesson for university teachers as well, who uh, including myself, uh, you know, uh, who, who often don't see beyond the tip of the iceberg, right? So I think, um, yeah, I, I, to answer your question, I think it's that the, the, the class friction at the time and the lack of awareness of privileged people like our protagonist slash narrator, the teacher, uh, into burning, glaring social issues. I think uh, these are some of the, uh, I would say, themes that stand out. But themes are usually what we make out of what's in the story. So there is no ready-made formula to say this, um, um, you know, the, the, that, that there is a theme A and B. There could be 100 themes for I like, care. Yeah. Yes, Tilini, yes. <laughs> Hello, sir. Can I ask yes. you a question? Thank you for the really good session. Uh, I, I, I can imagine you rolling my, your eyes at me uh, after I ask, but I'm going to go ahead <laughs> with the question. Uh, I, I'm not sure how you feel about this, but uh, uh, so my, my question is like, we are aware of the Sri Lankan Tamil diaspora writing. No? We have this Omakiani. And we have uh, Visakhesu Chandrasekharan and all these uh, writers. Like they are pretty dominant when it comes to like Sri Lankan writing. I remember when uh, studying with you as well, like a huge portion of the novels were like from them. Uh, is, is there a Sinhala diaspora writing in literature now? Is it like? <laughs> yeah, I think the Sinhala diaspora has always been there. Um, it's just that, you know, they were not good enough to make the Javadana Pura syllabus, uh, if I may put it that way. No, I mean, like, um, no, definitely, I would say, uh, well, Chandrasekharam, for one, uh, has actually repatriated 
chandrasekhar is now chandrasekharam is uh, is uh, uh, pretty much in colombo by the way he's uh-huh. repatriated uh, right? what you what you call the expatriate right uh, he's an ex expatriate ex ex oh, okay. he's, he's come back now right he's pretty much uh, i think he's in the front of many human rights related fronts right teaching at colombo university and so forth uh but yes i mean people who have a singhala so to say heritage or who come from a singhala background uh, there are definitely some uh, i would say even interesting uh, people living outside sri lanka producing literature at a consistent uh, rate if i may just share a couple uh, people like uh, channa vikramasekara for example right channa vikramasekara's latest novel tracks it actually um, discusses some uh, same sex uh, tensions within expatriate singhala you know kind of communities uh, vikramasekara is based in melbourne he's been writing quite consistently uh i'm looking for i can't look at him just now i'm looking for a novel which came out 3 uh, 3 years ago uh, which i really found um which really kind of uh, caught my imagination a novel called uh, ruins it's by a writer called rajit savanadasa um i'm just looking left right center for the book i can't locate it rajit savanadasa he he also has been living outside sri lanka for a very long time uh, i think for the last uh, 16 17 years right but a very very nuanced account of sri lanka immediate uh, the, the 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 phase immediate before the war ended and the you know the immediate aftermath uh, ruins so these are two examples there are there are many writers uh, whom you can you know fit into this little category uh, you referred to uh, the diasporic writers of uh, singhalese heritage yeah thank you sir yeah yeah sure hi Nandra, this is Indira here. Hi, Nel- hi to Nelani and everybody. Uh, just yes. one question. Yeah, nice to see you, and it's lovely to be listening to you. Uh, uh, the question is one accusation that comes from the Sinhala reading public, like who also read in English, is that Sri Lankan writers in English are not sensitive enough. If I may, you know, that the reiterate the word, they're not sensitive enough. to the let's say well burning issues or the most sensitive issues which the people of sri lanka face they have faced and are facing now because uh, this is what the singhala reading public thinks because they come from a different background particularly from a different class so how would you answer that kind of a question behind that <laughs> and also you right? mentioned one something i noticed no, this is not a question this is a comment yeah. something i noticed is uh, your discussion like in your dis- in, in your talk you mentioned sri jayawardena pura so many times yeah i think uh, yeah. so so okay. so yeah that is that is itself a symptom to the answer to the question i think uh, the kind of yeah. uh, you know the kind of background the, the grooming you have you can't like obviously divorce it from your expression right you carry it like a backpack right but uh, look i would i would put it this way uh, indira like i can approach it in two ways one is uh, no yeah maybe maybe you're right but it depends on the kind of uh, commitment a writer you know invests him or herself with in presenting a certain reality i would say the same thing about uh, singhala writers right there is no guarantee that a singhala writer uh, you know represents or puts on paper a particular community a particular historical moment or a particular reality uh, any better than an english writer uh, would it depends on the individual writer and how he or she invests in that project right so there is a certain degree of i would say learning as well as unlearning that goes into writing uh but yeah. very often i would say 
the kind of criticism you shared uh, it also comes from uh, some let's say bilingual intellectuals or even english writers who have yeah. connections with singhala writerly circles who feel a little yeah. who feel that they have to apologize on behalf of english writers right yeah. i mean that yeah. there, there are the, 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 that criticism is true but it's not only a criticism valid to english writers it's something to do with yeah. how you invest yourself as a writer i think that's where the that's yeah. where the crux is okay thanks yohan thank you and tilini this is uh, ruins if uh, okay. if anyone here uh, is looking for a good you know a more contemporary novel by a sri lankan writer uh, rajit sahana das uh, is the name um, ruins is his game so uh, yeah younger yes sir paul mm-hmm. pereira here yes <laughs> no i'm not not a question but have yeah. you uh, read my review of uh, ruins no sir no i haven't okay so you okay no no because i but that that was sent to me as a it was one of the books that we had to uh, had to judge for the dsc prize so that's oh, why okay. long 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 ago and it's an advantage because when you get a book that early you can you can do a review of it so so i i, I reviewed it uh, soon after it came out and i agree with you that it's uh, that it's extremely uh, it is powerful in lots of ways i have problems issues with it some of the you know yeah. the one going getting into a trance and you know going into another world there are certain uh, sections of the novel that i think are little uh, remember she yeah, goes yeah. on that uh, walk where she has and this some kind of beat beat we kind of experience i think uh, there are some issues that are heavy than all but on the whole when you when you in certainly in dealing with the with the middle class reality and i i, I think it, it is quite powerful so i agree with you there and also i thought he was like witty in a very memorable way in certain places yeah uh, about pilaus and everything if and you pilaus remember <laughs> yeah so at least uh, the two pereras are on the same page on this yeah so when it, where, yeah when he comes to ruins yes <laughs> when he comes to ruins <laughs> yeah uh bihanga there is a question question on chat right yeah yeah can you explain the center stage of music in fiddle of kolupitiya this is an run singer poem right yes yeah unfortunately I, my memory is uh, I, i i have read this poem but i don't remember the poem this is all i remember there is a fiddler somewhere you know on the pavement is fiddling away and there is this woman slash narrator slash and run singer who sees him and you know has some observations to make that's that's all i remember unfortunately so i uh, maybe you can tackle this question later nelani i don't yeah, know yeah i i I'll, i'll tackle that question later and I, i i also remember i didn't particularly like this poem too much um <laughs> i felt that uh, there was a very you know classist attitude that came with it at the time but look this is about 20 years ago right So maybe I would like read it differently of, if I in, read it today. In one of your reviews, you were to a certain extent uh, defending Anne Varsing her for those reviews which said that like she was having an elitist and classist outlook. To a certain extent, you were oh. defending her. I was going through one of those reviews. And- yeah, I think I'm 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 trying to like I'm trying to unmake my enemies yeah. in my old age. Yes. So I think yeah. i'm trying to unmake i realize uh, you know i'm i'm suffocated by the number of people i've offended who are like you know glaring at me from all ends so i'm trying to unmake yeah, that's a good oh, this practice. is this is being recorded right okay fine it's all right it's okay so it's it's on record i'm trying to okay <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah i'm not in a uh, i i don't think i remember it well enough to kind of go into this kind of question this this more focused right yes yeah and also i think i received a direct message uh, which should which should be directed to you it wasn't a, it's not a question yeah. uh, but uh, yeah. it's like a, um it's feedback really like that uh, he has enjoyed the session and uh, that and run a senior they studied and run a senior at school by fun uh, and thank you for the session and that he learned no a lot 
Yeah, cool. Um, oh, I think someone uh, is talking. Sir, I'm Sunny Bhagman, sir, and, and I'm still schooling, sir. Sir, firstly, I would like to thank you about your great presentation, sir. I, the question which I wanted to ask is, how can we improve our literature skills and our knowledge? Oh, that's a PhD question. Uh, <laughs> that I think we'll have to, like, spend... Uh, how can you give a short answer for a question like that? That's a very, it's a huge question. Um, I think the the shortest answer is it's the same as how you learn to swim, you know? That's the shortest answer. It's how you, it's the same as how you learn to swim. You have to dive into the river or the pool or whatever, keep swimming. So to improve your position in literature or in this kind of cultural engagement, you have to get into the culture, get into it and float about for a while. So it's, uh, you can't say there's one way, but maybe we can have this conversation. We, we can have a better conversation about this, uh, maybe outside this space. I, I don't know, that's my feeling. Uh, I, I would like to keep this uh, more or less in the area of Sri Lankan writing, but this kind of question we can, if you want, we can talk about it, um, you know, outside this space. Yeah. But the long, the short answer is you kind of stay with it without drowning. Okay, sir. Thank you. So I think uh, those are like all the questions that we have uh, for this session. I believe uh, we can end it now. Okay. So I will just give some concluding remarks if you're okay with it. Yeah. So, uh, Without embarrassing me, of course, yeah. Oh, oh no. Never. Never. Yeah, okay. Okay. So, uh, yeah. th uh, thank you so much for the very informative session. Like, you framed it from the Sri Lanka, throughout the Sri Lanka literary scene, from the Sri Lankan English novel, as you said, uh, to the poetry that challenged the status quo and to rightly perfect. Um, and I also want to thank the participants for coming. Like, I was really happy to see some very familiar names in chat, like uh, our beloved Indiramis, uh, Tilly, my friend, uh, and some of my old Jagra students like Chatushki, uh, and I saw some students all months uh, earlier as well. And of course, uh, my uh, own students of Southeastern, uh, to which, uh, to, to whom are the reason why I organized this session. And uh, thank you so much, Vihanga, for doing this session for them and uh, kind of uh, frame, framing this session based on our syllabus and uh, doing this for them because I think uh, the students uh, really needed this and uh, they really learned a lot. So for them, uh, I really thank you. And uh, yes, so those are what I wanted to say. And uh, I think we can end the session here because we do not have any questions. Yeah, if you like, give me the last uh, last oh, yes, say. Please. I would I would also say that uh, I'm I'm also quite aware that maybe I wouldn't have connected as some people would have liked me to, uh, because that is quite normal when you meet someone new. It takes about two three days for people to yeah. you know mm -hmm. learn the same language, connect at the same level, and also maybe on hindsight I would say I could have perhaps narrowed down the area a bit. Maybe I was trying to uh, go a little bit beyond what I could have done in 40 minutes. But that being said, I hope that I left enough clues for people to, you know, pick up and go ahead, uh, expanding their reading interests, expanding their research interests on yes. Sri Lankan writing from immediate post-independence to, you know, 1993. And, um, Thank you for being patient with me. Thank you for being a part of this. And uh, Nelani, on behalf of uh, Southeastern University, uh, thank you for uh, inviting me. Thank you so much.